Welfare Reform Committee for 2016. Uh, can I ask everyone to make sure that mobile phones and other electronic devices are either switched off or turned to aeroplane mode? Um, today, Alec Johnson is substituting for John Lamont, and uh, I've got apologies from Neil Finlay. Um, first item on the agenda, can we agree to take items four and five in private? Thank you. Um, second item on the agenda is a consideration of the subordinate legislation Welfare Fund Scotland Regulations uh, 2016 draft. Um, and we're taking evidence. The, the first session, we have Nicky McLean, who's the director, and Paul McFadden, who's the head of complaints standards at the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman. Uh, welcome. Uh, do either of you have a, an opening comment to make uh, before we start? Um, just to, to say thank you to the committee for the invitation today. Um, we're obviously taking on this new function from the 1st of April 2016 the, of second tier reviews and happy to um, uh, discuss the work that we've done in preparation for that. Do you think that uh, these new powers um, and this new function could change the, the role that the Ombudsman has at the moment? Um, I, I think that uh, Scotland in comparison to other ombudsman schemes across the UK is quite unusual now in that um, the majority of other public service ombudsmen across the UK do also have other functions um, and I, it doesn't appear to impact significantly on their ability to carry out that, um, that the classic ombudsman complaint handling function. So I think that um, we're fairly confident that it won't influence the, uh, the nature and the makeup of the work that we do around complaints. Okay. Because you're a, a non-governmental body and you're responsible to Parliament, um, you've drafted and designed um, your own appeals procedure. Um, will those who have been refused um, by local authorities and who appeal to you, will they have the right of representation? They will. Paul, would you? Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> in the vast majority of occasions we expect that these decisions or the reviews that we'll be making decisions on will be able to conclude on the basis of what of the information that has already been collected and information already presented i think that's the experience of the current review stage um, when the scheme was being designed um, we specifically asked for the ability to take um, oral hearings or conduct oral hearings um, where we thought that fairness may dictate that was required now that wasn't felt to be necessary <clears throat> by the government at that stage, but we felt that we wanted to future-proof um, our system to make sure that we had all the available tools to do that. Um, a future-proof against emerging human rights legislation, for example, on advice of our lawyers. In the event that we do think that it's necessary to have an oral hearing, people will have the right to have um, representation. The nature of the scheme, the nature of the client group, and those who will be making applications for review mean that many of them are represented in a contact, will be represented in contact with us by advocacy and support groups. That's something we expect, and we're already engaging with those groups to make sure all their needs are catered for. You said that the government didn't think that that facility was necessary at this stage, but in a sense it's got nothing to do with the government because you're not responsible to the government. So why is the government able to tell you what is appropriate and what's not appropriate? I think, I think it was in terms of the um, founding legislation. So when the proposals were at an early stage, um, discussions on what the legislation may contain, for example, um, on seeing early drafts of that, we were of the view that this was something that we thought would, would be a good addition. Um, the government weren't directing in that stage, but clearly the government are in charge of drafting the legislation to bring forward to Parliament. Yeah, except that it's Parliament's responsibility to pass the legislation and you're a body that is responsible to Parliament and not to the government. So I'm kind of perplexed and puzzled a bit about you um, having to accede to something that the government wanted rather than something that Parliament decided. And ultimately, Parliament does pass um, on a majority vote. But y you're indicating that it's very much it's, it was the government that decided this. No, I've maybe given the wrong impression of ceding um, authority to the government on that occasion. I think th these were early discussions around what the proposal may look like. So I think looking at what a, um, the Ombudsman function may look like in terms of reviews, and we've seen early proposals, this is one of the things that we decided to propose and put into that in terms of what went to Parliament for them to decide what we should be, um, how we should take this forward. 
So you, you say that you think that most of the appeals or challenges will be determined on the, the basis of the information uh, which is already um, available. But given the decision that had previously then been made, um, is there an appeal function where people can have representation should they wish, or does that require um, a change to regulations or a change to procedures? No, I think if people ask for representation and take bring forward the review, then we will certainly you know, be open to, to, to them doing that. I really do think that it won't be necessary, and I think that's the experience of the existing review function in terms of people bringing forward. But we'll always you know, be open to people making their case in any way that they would wish to do so. Um, yeah, but, but with all due respect, um, you, you might not think it's necessary, but if you're someone who's had a claim refused and feel strongly about it, um, surely um, they should have a say in whether or not they should have the opportunity to put the case to you, and particularly if you decide that um, you decide not in their their favour. So, so there's two aspects to it. Um, the first is, given what you said previously about the government decision, do you have the powers, um, or does it require a change if there is to be representation? And then the second point is, at what stage in development um, will you decide that representation will be allowed? I think under, under the principles of natural justice, of course, and, and the way in which the process will work, we will share, as people bring um, review requests to us at Tier 2, they, we will share the information that we're considering in reaching our decision and they can input into that. Um, they will see the evidence on which we're basing our decisions and they will be able to provide their own evidence. Um, there will be contact with individuals uh, either um, in writing or over the phone depend or face-to-face -face interviews. So I think there are significant opportunities built into the process and built into the draft statement of practice um, that, that we've been working towards that allow people to, to input into the decision-making process. But yeah, the evidence that this committee has heard from a whole range of organisations in relation to other benefits is that not only those organisations, but the people that they represent actually value the opportunity to have someone representing them. Um, there are some of us in this committee that have had an experience of going to tribunal uh, and representing claimants who have been turned down. But what, what seems to be coming across is that almost a paternalistic view that, well, yes, we, we will look at all the information and we'll do it fairly. And, um, you know, they will have the opportunity to provide information to us. That's not quite the same. You know, if you're not confident in reading and writing, if you have a difficulty in understanding, <coughs> then you know, someone explaining it on your behalf is sometimes a far better option. And I still Absolutely. haven't heard a, an answer to the first point. Do the rules, the regulations, the procedures allow you, given what was previously said about the government, to make a decision that, yes, representation uh, is available? Yeah. And at what point in the general development of the scheme will you make a decision that you will start to have advocates in on behalf of claimants? If, if, it may help if I just clarify how our process and procedure is laid out. So the enabling legislation allows us to develop and consult on our statement of practice and a, a set of rules for oral hearings. We are completely in control of that and we've consulted on that and, and received broad support for what we've outlined there. Um, I think the oral hearings point may be a little bit of a red he herring at this point. I think the majority of what we're going to do is speak to people. I think we've designed our process and our service in a way which is completely accessible. Um, that was our decision to mean that people can phone us to make a review. If they would like their advocate or support worker or any, uh, anyone else representing them to um, put forward their case to us, then yes, we will do that and we have full discretion to do that and we will um, on most occasions do that. Uh, perhaps I'm missing something, but you know, in the years where, where I was representing people uh, at tribunals, um, there was always the opportunity to, to write in and to explain uh, the, the problem. But the whole point of an independent tribunal 
was that they looked at something objectively, they listened to the evidence, and people had the chance to explain what their case was. And, and again, I come back you know, to the comment I made earlier, it sounds a bit paternalistic that you've decided that well, not, it's not really necessary for you to come and explain because you can provide all the evidence you want, you can get someone to write a letter, and we'll just do that. Now, if someone, and, you know, each of us that, that deals with constituency cases gets it that, you know, people can say, but I want to see you face to face, I want to explain something to you because, you know, and they've got the right to do that, but you're, in a sense, assuming that right for them that they don't, well, not just even assuming that right, you're deciding that you will be able to tell from the written evidence or someone phoning up in, on their behalf. What if someone says, no, look, you've got this wrong. I want to have the right to appear with an advocate to challenge the decision. And will they be allowed to do that? Yes, they absolutely have the, the right to request that. Um, and so I, I think, um, as Paul says, Presently, through the complaints process, we, we regularly deal with representatives rather than complainants. We have experience of doing that, um, but also that people will be able to request um, the method that, that they, they wish to communicate with us. Right. Um, I, think in, I think some of the data that we've received from um, the consultation, though, indicates that actually a lot of people wouldn't be interested in that kind of representation and... and um, perhaps might find that intimidating also so I think we uh, and that that's some of the feedback that we've had through the consultation process so um, I think that the um, statement of practice that we we are developing at the moment it gives choice about how you put yeah. forward your representation and I think that that is that's in response and listening to the feedback that we're getting ac across the range of stakeholders yeah. I don't doubt that, that, that people feel um, <laughs> You know, personal representation intimidating, and that's the whole point of having advocates and representatives because um, these procedures are very challenging. But people often find having to write and explain and, and not having the chance to put forward their case, they find that uh, in, in, intimidating as well. But you know, I'm pleased that you've now accepted that people have the right to a hearing and to advocates representing them at the hearing. Will that be made clear at the beginning that you have the choice for either for us to deal, deal with it by correspondence or phone or you have the choice of coming uh, to a hearing and you can bring a representative with you? Will that be made clear? We, we've made clear that people can choose a representative to engage with us and, and people in the consultation responding to the consultation have been widely supportive of, of our approach in accessibility and openly. The concept of an oral hearing, in terms of a more formal oral hearing, yeah, we will meet with representatives, we'll meet with applicants, and if we do that, the more for formal oral hearing is something that you know is clear to people and when they can request that and when the circumstances in where we will take that because it's in the interest of fairness. But forgive me, Mr McFadden, I think what you're saying is slightly different from what Ms McLean is saying because she gave a commitment very clearly that people could have uh, an oral hearing should they want it and you're now starting to put hearing. conditions on that they can request an oral hearing and that will be made clear to them at the beginning yes. that if they wish they can have an oral hearing with a representative I, I think what well in terms of the development of the communication materials that we use what what I think what we need to be careful about is making sure that we're giving um, we're giving sufficient information um, but what we are doing is we're um, using our stakeholders to trial and test the communication materials that we develop. So I think we need to be careful about um, the level of information and the clarity of the information that we're, we're providing. Um, what, what I said is people will have the right to request an oral hearing. The decision on whether an oral hearing will be held will remain ours as the, as the, the statement of practice is written at this point in time. That would be an interesting concept if, uh, in relation to claimants challenging um, the DWP on a range of things, if uh, the power to determine whether there should be representation rested with the DWP, we would be outraged. But you're saying that you will retain that power. 
that that's certainly the intention at the moment. That 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 is what's been included in the document that's gone out. So, for so for a range of independent and benefits, or, or, or you know, Westminster related benefits, um, that there are independent tribunals and people can access those tribunals if they wish. But in relation to this one, you're you will be the one that decides whether or not there'll be an oral hearing. That's right. And I think it may be helpful to say that we have consulted on this point throughout the development of this over the past year with both third sector agencies and local authorities in, in talking through that and, and consulted fully on the circumstances where we would um, use the discretion to, to have a oral, oral hearing. And we've had a broadly supportive response to that and people recognise that that's a, a fair way to proceed. Um, the, so and that particular concern, I, mm. I don't believe, has been raised at any, at any point um, okay. to this stage. Right. Open it up to others. Thank you. Anyone else? Christine? Just, just a, a point of clarity. Is the system that you're proposing for, for tribunals or for a hearing the same as the procedure that currently exists for DWP hearings? Is it? Have you just mirrored the same procedure? Because not everyone gets a hearing with the DWP uh, the same way that you're expressing. Is that, is that right? Am I, have I picked it up correctly? Um, well, sorry, the, the question was, have we modelled it on the DWP? Yes, the, the, the convener you know, is suggesting there's two, there's two different procedures in play here, one with the DWP um, where you, know, you can request a hearing. And, and yeah. from what I'm, I, I'm hearing this morning, sorry for using the word hearing over again, is that you're, you're using the exact same procedure that anyone who would challenge a decision of the DWP would no, be using. I, I don't think it would be fair to say that. I, I think, though, that as Paul suggested this is um, slightly a red herring because I think our, our um, again through the consultation process, through the discussions that we've had with third sector, with stakeholders, the anticipation is that the majority of these re review cases will be dealt with over the phone um, through discussion with the applicant um, and in correspondence with um, local authorities, bearing in mind that uh, the payments that, that we're making, we, we're working to very tight timescales, um, and, uh, and so we have to ensure as, that we can process these as quickly as possible. Um, if you make a comparison with the existing interim scheme, these decisions are already being made in, this, in, in a similar vein by local authorities. Um, I think that, broadly speaking, there's general acceptance that the interim scheme, whilst there might be some tweaks and changes that need to be made, has been working relatively effectively. So I don't think that what we're proposing in terms of dealing with the majority of these applications, these reviews, um, through uh, telephone contact, face-to-face -face meeting or uh, written correspondence is, um, uh, is, a, is not a sensible move. So I think what we're talking about is a very, very small number of cases where it's um, difficult to establish the facts in any other way other than an oral hearing. So I, I, I think it would be um, a shame if we spent the majority of the discussion on that particular point, because I think it is um, that I think that it will arise in, a, in f very few occasions. Um, but what we wanted to have is the ability to use that as an option if there is no other way of um, establishing the facts in a, in a fair way. Yeah, at a previous meeting of, the, of this committee, we heard from some of the, the third sector and other organisations that, that either support or, or deliver services and support. <clears throat> and some of them were, were saying that the interim, the interim uh, scheme, you know, had some challenges at the start, but those challenges had been ironed out and, you know, had started to progress uh, pretty well. Now, you said that you've had to make some wee tweaks and things in the system. Is there anything that came up as a particular challenge or maybe a good example of good working practice that you have now incorporated into the new procedures and, and, and the challenges that ha have, have arisen? What sort of a resolutions did you come up to? come up with to deal with those? Where I was referring to tweaks in the system, I think I was more meaning in relation to the Scottish Government's own guidance for local authorities, and I know there's been some feedback and exchange about um, changes to the guidance for local authorities. Obviously, um, our service doesn't, doesn't commence until the 1st of April. Yeah, okay. um, we will have an ongoing review, and no, and no doubt there may well be changes to our statement of practice as we as we begin to see cases coming through. I think um, from uh, 
in terms of what the new uh, structure will bring, because you then have tier two reviews being assessed by a national body, I think that that does give you a, a national picture that, that is perhaps not there within the existing interim arrangements. Yeah, one of the key factors of delivering and developing a new social security system for Scotland is to have di dignity and respect built into the system, and I'm sure that would be something that you, that you would be monitoring. Is there anything you've picked up in the interim scheme that's allowed you then to set in play for the work that you'll do come the 1st of April to ensure that that dignity and respect remains in the system and that the person, the claimant, um, and their needs are, are, are key to that? Oh, yeah, uh, as Nick has outlined, our experience of the interim scheme has been limited to all over the complaints. So we've seen a relatively small number of complaints coming through over that time, and, and to be honest, most of them have been about dissatisfaction with the decision. The things that we've seen have been about procedural matters in terms of the guidance not being followed or being misinterpreted or misapplied. And when we've been looking at that, even though up to this point, up to 1st of April, we've not been able to change the decision or review discretion, We've discussed or made recommendations to the local authority around aspects where it didn't appear there was a fairness because of a procedural failing. And those occasions, local authorities have, have, have changed awards or, or made decisions on the back of that. I think, I think beyond that, I think that's you know it's, we, we don't have the experience yet of any wider aspects of where the, 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 the scheme may be feeling in terms of dignity, respect, fair and reasonableness. But that is going to be a role from first of April, and I think you know once. Once we have a body of, of cases through, we have a bit of experience through this with the team, then we'll be able to kind of reflect on that a bit more in, yeah. in a bit more okay. detail. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, you have gone through in your written evidence uh, steps that you've taken to prepare uh, for the, the task that you're about to, to undertake. You say that you've consulted with local authorities, um, with the third sector, uh, including advocacy reps, uh, and you've also uh, looked at the independent review scheme for the social fund, uh, which will still be operating in Northern Ireland. Um, you rightly say that that uh, scheme has a, a fairly good reputation, and you were keen to learn lessons from that. Would you like to, to tell us what lessons you've learned uh, during the course of uh, these interactions between the practitioners at local authorities, the third sector, uh, and of course the IRS. Yeah, I, I think in terms of um, a consultation throughout the last year, and I think the first thing we did around this was, was set up our sounding boards, one for the third sector representatives and one for local authorities. Through the engagement with those sounding boards, throughout um, the consultation responses, throughout the discussions we've had with everyone, with IRS, the, the Northern Ireland Commissioner, I think one of the key things that has all has come out very clearly is the need for good communication in, in, in all respects. I think being open and accessible is clearly another one that I think has come out across quite quite strongly. And, and timeliness, um, clearly the nature of these decisions, is, you know, the nature of the circumstances uh, that are leading to people making these decisions means that quick um, and robust decisions are absolutely crucial. The IRS was held up in, in very good regard, and I think that was clear from the responses to the, the government's initial consultation on its proposals here, where SPSO was one option. Uh, where IRS came across qu quite uh, very well in terms of its reputation and in terms of time on this. We looked at the IRS, we've, we've adopted, in fact, our own time scales have adopted those of the IRS, um, and that's something that, you know, even though it's going to be a new scheme and we're going to have to get up to speed, that's something we're aiming to, to replicate. So, yeah, there's, there's been a lot in there that I think we've been able to, um, to take in terms of, of key lessons, and we continue to talk with local authorities in terms of how they operate the existing review or secondary to review system as well. Have you any idea how many... Um in percentage terms, how many times a, a complaint would lead to uh, an oral hearing in the IRS situation? I think this is something that uh, Karamjit Singh gave evidence to this committee in yeah. 2014. They don't actually, in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, my understanding and the evidence that he gave to this committee was that they don't have the powers to hold, hold oral hearings. But you have that power. Okay. Um, in terms of your approach, you talk in the paper uh, about equalities and human rights assessment um, to make sure that uh, the process takes full account of the rights and needs of users. Uh, can you tell us uh, what your uh, equality and human rights assessment uh, has found, where you're at with that? Is it completed? Are you satisfied with the findings of it? Um, the the quality of human rights impact system is not completed. I think that's largely because we are still in the process of finalising our, our, our process and, and, and our approach. 
The feedback from the consultation was very much that this is something that needs to be kept open. And I think it's something that's, particularly through the first year, is something that's going to be a live document that we'll continue to to add to. The clearly, the issues around it are around the fairness and reasonableness, accessibility, all of these aspects that are clearly coming across. Um, yeah, I, I think that's something that we'll continue to monitor and, and continue to speak to third sector organisations about. So obviously we're not up and running yet, so you intend to monitor all aspects of this when the process starts from the 1st of April um, and uh, you will continue to monitor what those impacts actually are, yeah? Yes. Yeah, I think I think we've done so far, we've done a, a, a significant amount of work um, to understand and anticipate what some of the blocks and barriers to people accessing our service might be and but I think that as you say that needs to be an ongoing review and and that kind of monitoring has that taken place in the Northern Ireland uh, situation for example do they continue to to monitor monitor these impacts did you find that out when you were looking at what they were up to that's, that's not something I'm aware of um, I think um, no, I, I think the, the issues around accessibility and, and making sure that the, the data they collect, making sure that or identifying any issues of you know um, equality impact assessment, I mean, it's something they do on a, an ongoing basis, but it's not something where they have in terms of a formal process. I, I think what they do do, which is good practice and which we'll ever endeavour to do, is they do maintain significant contacts with the interested stakeholders and they do a lot of engagement. And I think that um, we've done that today and we need to continue to do that so that we're routinely receiving feedback ab about what our service feels like for users. So you're going to follow their lead in that regard? I, I think that um, stakeholder engagement is key in, in um, getting the feedback about what it feels like to use our service, yes. And go beyond their system by allowing oral hearings to take place? If yes, in, in a number of respects. I mean, I think the oral hearings is obviously something that Parliament decided to, to give to us, I think. Our, our approach to taking um, reviews, applications verbally is something that would go beyond what the IRS and, and or certainly the, the Northern Ireland Commissioner would do, where they would mainly take written applications. So there are aspects of that where we feel that we've tried to be, uh, we've tried to improve on, on what's there. Uh, in terms of uh, Parliament scrutinising your uh, work in this area, currently the Local Government Committee looks at your annual report and uh, scrutinises based o o on that uh, and obviously you have responsibilities to the uh, to the Scottish Parliament's corporate body. Um, is uh, this line of work going to feature in the annual report or is that going to feature separately um, and will Parliament have the ability to scrutinise um, what you're doing here on a, a regular basis? Yeah, we, we would hope so, and I think we would certainly report as part of our, our annual report in terms of our performance, in terms of our accountability and transparency. You know, that said, I think in terms of our experience of the scheme, um, as, as you know, we report regularly um, back to all the, the bodies under jurisdiction on the learning that we've received from complaints that we receive, issues where we feel that improvements could be made. And I think this is something that would merit its own, you know, distinct reporting back on, on those issues in terms of, you know, the key issues, the case studies, the facts and figures that we've seen. Uh, and we would be in regular engagement with local authorities and the government as well, where we've identified things where there may be barriers to people in terms of their fair and reasonable access to, to the review system or the scheme itself. And that uh, reporting function, uh, as you currently do, would be universal, so everybody could learn from uh, one body's mistake. Yeah. Yes, I think it would be. A, but we don't have a statutory role in terms of monitoring best practice for the welfare fund, as we do with complaints. But yes, we would be looking to identify um, areas of good practice as well as areas of concern, and we'd be feeding them back at a national level. We're already engaging with the practitioners themselves through a practitioners um, network. We continue to go along to that and feed back our experience and help them to learn from that collectively. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Yeah, and I think that's uh, it's a very helpful commitment. Thank you for that. Claire Adamson. Oh, um, I think Mr Stewart kind of stole my thunder with the last question he had there. Um, but I, I would like to dig into it a little bit more in terms of if there is a systemic failing, either from a particular local authority or misinterpretation that you felt was there across Scotland, what would be the mechanism and time scale for actually feeding that back either to the local authorities or to the government, um, given that you don't have that statutory duty, as you've just said? Yeah, 
I mean, I think if it's in relation to an individual circumstances, then that is immediate, and that would be you know picking up the phone to a local authority to, to address something which is um, an issue for an individual. If it's an individual local authority, but with more than one individual, again, we would engage that local authority quite quickly. Um, so those you know reports or decisions will be going back very very quickly on, on these, where we will have recommendations for improvement. Um, we will regularly engage with local authorities and government, and, and again when and how quickly we do that will be based on, on need and, and the urgency of, of the blockage to the system, of the concerns of the system, or whether or not people are being uh, treated in a way which is not fair and reasonable or does not respect their, um, their dignity. Thank you. Um, can I come back um, to individual decisions? Um, do you need to have any regard to um, a local authority's budget, how much is left in the budget when you make a decision? Um, and secondly, uh, can you determine the level of payment which has been or which is to be made? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a finite fund, it's a finite budget, and I think if, if local authorities have run out of money, then you know it's not an entitlement; it's a discretionary scheme. We make a decision based on the information that was available at that time or the state of the scheme at the time and the priority that the scheme was at at the time the, pers the original decision was made and the person had brought their circumstances to the local authority. So there may be occasions where we are looking back slightly to where you know, the, the, there were funds but now there weren't funds and you know, that is something that we you know, make a decision on um, on the circumstances at that, that point in time. Um, the level of award or what has been awarded or how that's been awarded, that, that is part of a, the decision that's something that we will you know take into account in terms of our decisions assessing whether or not that has been fair and reasonable you know whether the discretion has been used correctly where the merits of the decision is correct and that's something that we will um, be able to make decisions on back to the local authorities as well as challenging whether or not um, a payment has been made um, on a claimant's part can the claimant actually challenge the level of payment that has been made they can, yes, and I, and I think that's you know those are going to be the difficult decisions. I think because you're looking at you know theatres of the local authorities, you're looking at a scheme with you know a discretionary scheme with lots of various points of discretion and, and some you know being made by decision makers using their own judgment on the facts and circumstances of individuals and the, the range of circumstances are, are, are huge. Um, but yes, that is something that we'll be able to consider in terms of what the applicant tells us, in terms of what the representatives tell us, what we feel is is, is fair and reasonable in terms of what the guidance says, the regulation says. And over and above that, what the aims of the scheme are in terms of you know, providing support to people in crisis or, or those who are coming out of care, for example? I, I think what we would be looking for from the local authority is um, that their decision is clearly set out and, and the reasons for reaching that decision, which would include the reasons for thinking that that level of payment was appropriate in that specific individual circumstances. So we would expect to see that within the decision. And, and if you see a pattern, for example... Um, where um, claims that were being determined in Edinburgh uh, were resulting in a different level of payment from claims being determined in West Lothian, um, would you have the ability to um, start making awards that would be based on what may be perceived to be the most favourable, or is that purely a matter for each local authority to determine? I think that, that comes back to the previous point that I made so our, our role is very much about assessing whether or not that level of payment has met that particular individual's needs in yeah. given their specific circumstances. So it's very much about the individual at that given time, um, as well as the level of priority that the local authority <laughs> has in place at that specific point in time that the original decision was made. OK, anyone else? Uh, thank you for your contribution this morning and uh, good luck with the implementation of the new scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll suspend for a few minutes to uh, allow a change to take place.
Welcome to Margaret Burgess, the Minister for Housing and Welfare. Um, and she is joined by uh, Will Tyler uh, and Stuart Fubister. Um, Minister, would you like to make a, an opening contribution to the meeting? Okay, uh, thank you, Convener, and thanks for the opportunity to discuss the Welfare Fund Scotland Regulations 2016. Since April 2013, the Scottish Welfare Fund has provided a safety net to some of the most vulnerable people in our society, helping around 178,000 low-income households, including 59,000 families with children. In the face of continued austerity imposed by the UK Government, the Fund acts as a lifeline for communities across Scotland, helping people in some desperate situations by everyday things like food, clothes and beds, keeping families afloat at difficult times. But not only does the Fund meet a, meet a very real need, it also signals this Government's commitment to creating a social security system which treats individuals with dignity and respect. The Scottish Government's Independent Advisor on Poverty's recent report highlights the Scottish Welfare Fund as providing critical practical support with a more person-centred and holistic approach than equivalents elsewhere. Developed in partnership with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities and with the support of the third sector, the Fund, I believe, is an excellent example of collaborative working. And I also believe this was evident from the supportive remarks made by the organisations that have already given evidence to this committee. The determination to do things differently resulted in Scotland's first substantive example of social security legislation. The Welfare Fund Scotland Act 2015 places a statutory responsibility on each local authority to maintain a welfare fund and establishes a new independent review process and importantly, it requires those who deliver the scheme to treat applicants with dignity and respect, sending a clear message about the kind of social security system we cre seek to create, which is one very much centred on the individual. Almost half of the £81 million spent to date has gone to communities in the 20% most deprived areas of Scotland. The Scottish Welfare Fund is, is an example of action already taken in Scotland, which provides a firm basis for tackling poverty effectively. The Welfare Fund's Scotland regulations will help to secure this by underpinning the Act and making the scheme permanent and statutory. It's always been our intention to set out the rules for the operation of the Fund through regulations and statutory guidance. And whilst the regulations may be the last legislative piece of the jigsaw, the Fund and its statutory guidance will be subject to ongoing review and scrutiny. It is our intention to review the guidance on an annual basis, taking account of feedback from local authorities, third sector stakeholders and any points identified by the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. And I welcome the Committee's ongoing interest in the Fund and I am happy to answer your questions on it this morning. Thank you, Thank you Minister, and I welcome the commitment to uh, review the situation on an annual basis, the guidance. I think that's, uh, that's extremely helpful. Um, one of the things that we've heard in, in a number of sessions, is, and also for this in written evidence from Who Cares Scotland, um, is the need for flexibility. Um, part of that uh, review that you will have, or that annual consideration in, in, in the guidance, will you be looking to make sure that the, the flexibility uh, is there in the system and uh, if changes need to be made, that they would be made? Absolutely, Convener. That's, that's the intention of the review. Um, we have very much taken on board, uh, and from the scheme from the outset, both the voluntary and the statutory scheme has about having a scheme that is consistent across Scotland but does allow that element of flexibility, which has been very much welcomed by local authorities. Uh, and we want to make sure that that is maintained. And if that's slipping away or it's not acting the way we would anticipate, then we will be reviewing it and take on board the comments from stakeholders. And if demand for whatever reason is, is much higher than anticipated and the, the budgets at a local level are, are, are struggling to cope, um, whose responsibility would it be to, to top up those budgets? Would it be the individual local authority or will the Scottish Government make a contribution if it's felt that uh, the budgets are, are, are not sufficient? 
No, the Scottish Government sets the, the, the level of the fund, the overall fund for Scotland, and we've agreed formula for distributing it, it, distributing it to the local authorities. Um, but if the local authorities are then expected to manage their budget annually uh, and keep an eye on their budget, and they are able to top that budget up, but there is, there's nothing that we've said that the Scottish Government will continually and constantly uh, top up. We will always look at that and look at future years. That budgets are looked at annually. In any case, for the Scottish Government, we'll always look at uh, the fund and if, there's, if it's sufficient um, to maintain it. We've also looked at uh, altering um, the distribution method as well, um, rather than based on the historic uh, social fund uh, distribution we're looking at actual spend, so for the next few years we're looking at actual spend in a local authority, so a percentage will be an actual spend and a, a percentage on um, need space, and that's, that's what we've agreed with local authorities at the moment. So in future years, uh, the allocation to individual local authorities could change depending on the level of spend and demand? For the next three years, it builds up to an absolute need space, yes. Right, okay, thank you. Kevin Stewart? Um, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, Minister, uh, we have probably scrutinised the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, much, much more than any piece of social security legislation has been scrutinised um, at, at, at Westminster. Uh, and we've seen change during the course of, of the, the development of, of, this, uh, of this new fund, including... Um, as you say, the, the building that dignity and respect uh, is mm -hmm. at the forefront uh, of this uh, social security system which we are establishing. Uh, and lessons have been learned during the course of this process because of the, the mm -hmm. amount of scrutiny. Can you assure the committee that the best practice um, that exists out there is exported throughout every local authority um, to make sure that, uh, that, this, uh, that this fund uh, is the best it possibly can be? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're, that's continual and continuous. And we'll be so we'll have a practitioner's group where they meet and discuss in different local authority areas. They have case studies where they look in one area how they, how they would deal with it, how another area will deal with it, and to look at best practice. And that's ongoing, and, and it should be in a fund such as this. And also now with the uh, Ombudsman doing the second tier reviews, they will be able to build in uh, their expertise, their view on it, and what could be done differently as well, and that would be taken on board. Um, the social fund teams across Scotland are keen to learn from other teams and best practice. I've visited a um, huge number of the, the frontline staff and they're absolutely something that they're, they, they actually appreciate the fact that they can get with others working in another area and discuss uh, how they, they can handle certain cases or how the guidance could be improved to make things clearer for them because we've got a role in that with the guidance and we hope we've done that. We've had a huge uh, input into our statutory guidance. Every local authority, I think, was represented at it, as well as a huge number of stakeholders uh, at our consultation on the, the guidance. Uh, I have to say that I'm hugely impressed by the, the welfare rights team in Aberdeen and the way that uh, they mm -hmm. are spreading information and sharing mm -hmm. best practice. Uh, one of the things which we did hear, uh, Minister, though, in evidence was um, from Who Care Scotland, and that's um, around about uh, the way that care leavers um, are treated and their, um, their ability to access the fund. And obviously, um, uh, councils like ourselves have roles as corporate parents and um, there are obligations under recent legislative change that they have. Can we ensure that all of those folks who are dealing with the fund in the 32 local authorities are aware of their responsibility as corporate parents to ensure that um, care leavers are treated as best they possibly can be when they go to access this fund? Absolutely. We've included a bit in the, the guidance about care, le about care leavers and about corporate the, the obligations of corporate parenting. 
and we listened very carefully to the evidence of Who Cares Scotland uh, and some of the suggestions that they said perhaps we could even be clearer in the guidance, put in uh, a case study, a good example, uh, and we'll certainly be considering that and also um, you know, working with them to ensure that, and, and if training is required, I think that was another suggestion um, from Who Cares Scotland, that there's some training in that element of it as well, and we're certainly willing to take all that on board. Thank you. Uh, and finally, um, one of the things which we have heard from many local authorities um, is the ability to signpost people onto other services mm -hmm. and other funds uh, when they have come to access the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, through the practitioners group uh, and other bodies, can we ensure that that signposting to help folk not only just out of that crisis at that point, but to help them um, uh, not to reach mm -hmm. crisis point in future. Yeah. Can we ensure that that signposting continues to take place? Oh, absolutely, because that's what's cr uh, critical to the fund. It makes it the, the, what's so much different from what was previously in place, that kind of whole holistic service, identifying where the support needs required and ensuring, and in some instances, it's more than just signposting. There are referrals made um, signposting, just telling someone to sort of approach another organisation, but there's actually assistance to get contact with that other organisation um, on behalf of someone who's been claiming something, you know, through the, so the Scottish Welfare Fund. So there's lots of that going on, and I would want to see that continuing. I think that's an absolutely crucial part of the whole service. It's not about just dealing with immediate crisis. It's about ensuring that person uh, gets support and assistance uh, to go on with their lives and not always you know, have to access the fund. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Okay, Alex. Thank you, Convener. During the operation of the interim scheme, uh, a great many lessons were learned, and it's been very impressive how the scheme has been improved over time and how that informed the, the final scheme that we're now in the process of bringing in. But one of the things that uh, has been noted uh, and surprised some people is the level of administration uh, costs that are within the total cost of the scheme. Now that we're bringing in the final regulations to get the new scheme in place, uh, are we in a position to uh, say that all has been done to ensure that administration costs are kept to a minimum and the highest proportion of the cost of the scheme possible is going to grants for claimants? I think we believe that that's what is currently happening. Uh, happening. The initial um, money transferred from the DWP um, was £5 million for administration, which we passed on to local authorities for administration. Um, it was then cut by the DWP, I think, to 4.6 million, uh, which we topped up to allow the local authorities still the five million pounds to administer the scheme. So we think that's that's sufficient to administer the scheme, uh, and it's a reasonable proportion of the overall budget. And you. I have heard from some local authorities, in fact, evidence that was given some time ago when I was a, a regular member of this committee, that some of them felt that they could do with more uh, financial support to cover the administration responsibility. Has that been discussed with local authorities and has that matter been um, brought to a conclusion? We've had a, had a number of discussions with local authorities about the administration costs of the scheme. Uh, what we have agreed is that they'll continue to get the £5 million. Mm -hmm. They'll no longer have to do any second tier reviews, so there won't have any costs involved in that, uh, because that's been passed to the Ombudsman. But we've continued with the same level of, of administration costs. And of course, as we move on and the scheme travels on as we move down the years, obviously it's something we'll always discuss with local authorities if they come and tell us. Uh, but however, the absolute focus uh, and the priority is that the bulk of the money should go out there to the people in our communities that desperately need it. Mm -hmm. With the new responsibilities uh, for other aspects of welfare that are coming along, is there a, a possibility that we may actually be able to use the, the individuals and the, the skills that have been gained by people working within local authorities to uh, spread their responsibility slightly to make that process more efficient? I think we always look at efficiency as we move on, but at the moment, you know, the, the scheme is run or administered by local authorities. Uh, 
in, in every 32 local authority areas. There is a huge deal of expertise uh, built up there, but it's up to each individual local authority where they deploy the staff, which section of the local authority, you know, because the, the, some um, local authorities' benefits and revenues uh, provide the Scottish Welfare Fund or administer it, and others that can be the social work department. So it's entirely up to the local authority how they can most efficiently operate the scheme in their area. Mm -hmm. But you will ensure that uh, there, there isn't, you know, where there appears to be a, a, a wide variation in administration costs within local authorities, the, you will continue to cap the scheme to ensure that that is not too great a burden on the finances. Yeah, well, the funding is agreed at the five million mm -hmm. local authorities have their proportion of that, and that's what they use to administer the scheme, and how they operate that is, is up to the, that local authority, but that amount of funding is agreed. That's the amount they get for, out of the five million. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Anyone else? If John. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Yeah, in, in the written evidence, uh, Minister, from the SPSO, uh, they talk about the the first tier internal reviews, which should be in writing and signed. Um, except under exceptional circumstances, and they, they express some reservations about that, but they're, go they're going to obviously work with it. I just wondered if you could reflect on why we're going down that road. It's not uh, possible, except in exceptional circumstances, to appeal orally. I think um, we've been quite clear that, um, that an appeal can be made, an oral appeal can be made, in terms of you know, over the telephone or whatever somebody can say they want to, or it's, I think we'd be clear it's a review of the decision. They can say over the telephone they want the, the, deficient, the decision reviewed. They can, um, even at a first tier review, they can use an uh, advice agency or someone else to assist them to, to put forward the review and the grounds for the review. So as it stands, and, and maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, as it stands, there's nothing prevents anyone um, making the review, either asking for a review on the telephone or in writing or with the assistance of a third party. Okay, thanks very much for clarifying that. Thank you. Okay, if nothing else, um, I'll move to item three on the agenda. Uh, that's the formal debate on the affirmative instrument. Uh, and can I invite the Minister to speak to and move the motion S4M-15227 in her name? I formally move. Thank you, Convener. Any comments from members? If not, I now put the question that the motion S4M-15227 that the Welfare Reform Committee recommends that the Welfare Fund's Scotland Regulations 2016 draft be approved. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Minister, uh, thank you very much for your contribution. I believe that this will be your last appearance at this committee before you stand down. Um, I believe can so, I, Convener. Can I thank you for your contribution uh, to the committee and uh, wish you well for whatever you do after uh, you stand down? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. And we'll now close the public part of the meeting. <laughs>